Okay, if there is nothing else, I would say, let's start. Okay, as I said, um, this is a controversial topic. Um, as you might have heard, it was in the press. Um, there were security incidents on a lot of HPC systems across Europe and also large German systems um, were down due to the security breach, especially HLRS and I think also Jülich and, and, and LZ. And it's not yet clear what happened, um, but this was, yeah, the, the, the starting point to say, okay, this is probably a topic that's interesting also for us. At our side, we don't know of any security breach, but I will talk about this general issues in a moment. So first of all, secure authentication on computer systems. Security is, is a difficult topic on computers because you cannot really ensure security. It's a very complex environment. And due to this complexity, you, you never can be really guarantee that everything is safe. It's just not possible. And even agencies or, or people who really care about security get hacked. So that beforehand. And that's also the reason why this topic is so emotional and, and controversial, because people feel so don't understand what's going on. They don't have a clear knowledge about what they should do, what's necessary, what's not necessary. It's a bit like coronavirus. Huh? Also there, we don't know what's real and what's necessary and what's not, because we just don't know. It's a complex topic and we don't know yet what's going on. And it's the same with computer security. And therefore, at some point, this trans there is a transition to belief yeah so a lot of people then say i believe this is not necessary yeah i'm no security expert i can just tell you best practice or what is commonly regarded to be a good idea and even in our group there are really very diverse opinions about this yeah people from and you have those a lot in in computer science from Security is, is a, a um, you cannot have security anyway, so how do you care? And uh, if someone wants to get in there, he gets in there. Yeah? So uh, to, to make it complicated makes no sense. Two, on the other end, people who have a very deliberate and thought over plan how to ensure security. So they encrypt their hard disk and they have a very well-planned key management and so on. Yeah? So we have everything even in the group between those extremes. So now some basics about secure authentication. So there are authentication factors and uh, you have three factors. There are knowledge factors. Knowledge factors are things you know, things like a password, passphrase, a PIN, for example, to your EC card is also a knowledge factor. Then you have ownership factors. This is something you own, obviously. So like the ID card, your cell phone, a hardware token. And also, for example, the secure shell public key or the private key, I have to say the private key, is also an ownership factor because you have the own, it's a software token, so to say. And finally, you have inheritance factors. This is a fingerprint signature, but also your location might be your face or anything that's connected to you. And in security, it is uh, accepted or that to really have high security, you want to have as many different independent factors as possible. Yeah? So multi-factor authentication is mandatory and all major internet providers, single sign-on providers like uh, Apple or Amazon, everybody now at least offers two-factor authentication so you have to have your password. And then in addition, as a second factor, for example, you get a pin sent on your smartphone, which you have to own. And there you are. And also, if you see with banking, it's also multi-factor because you have to own the card and you have to know the pin yeah, to use it. So just owning the card is not enough. Always with security is always a compromise between security and convenience because you are still need to be able to use the system. The, the computing system need to be productive still and to have everything secured and locked down as far as possible, you might end up with a setting 
where you don't want to do anything on the system. So this is always keep that in mind. And this is especially a topic with HPC, yeah, because there are there are people that think that in HPC those things are not confident anyway. So if a if a user account gets hacked, it's not really a problem. Yeah. And that be, being said, in a multi-user system, I asked our admins, and it seems to be accepted that this happens yeah you cannot prevent it user accounts in such a massive multi-user context will get hacked because people lose their password pin it on their screen whatever so in hpc environments the de facto standard for authentication or accessing the remotely accessing the system is secure shell and um First, I want to tell you some common security guidelines before I get to Secure Shell. So just common, accept, commonly accepted things. And this is a moving target. So this looked different five, 10 years ago. So obvious things, yeah, trivial things. Never share a password or a key for different hosts and systems. So, I mean, you do shopping probably on the internet a lot and you have tons of passwords. You have password for Amazon, for eBay, for Google, and, and so on. Yeah? And you don't want to use the same password. Why? Well, it's, it's, it's obvious. If one gets breached, you don't want that someone can access all your accounts. So you, if a password gets lost, you only want to be one thing to be lost. And then you already see what you also have today are those so-called single sign-on passwords, where one password is the key to a lot of other passwords. And of course, this password is especially precious and you have to especially care that this is not lost. Yeah, This, this is, again, a trade-off Yeah, because at least me, I cannot remember dozens of passwords. So you never should store a password clear text anywhere in any form, not in a file, not on a paper. I know that's tempting. Yeah, I know people have a small drawer with, key, with cards and write the passwords on there. Whatever. I mean, at, at the end, an encrypted password is nothing else than having such a key card drawer in a safe, yeah, for example. Then use strong passwords. What is a strong password? Again, you can discuss about that. I read 15 to 20 characters. Yeah. Others say, are you crazy? I No one can remember 15 to 20 character password. It can contain all character classes. And as you may know from XKCD, there is a, a comic on that. So a, it is totally fine to have words and sentences. Yeah? The length is more important than the randomness, so to say. I will, I will come to a moment how to manage that. We didn't speak about how to manage that because we already re realized we have a lot of passwords nowadays. If you need 15 to 20 characters, I don't know. One thing is clear. The longer, the harder it is to hack. Yeah? That's, that's fact. So if you want to stay sane, in my opinion, you need a password manager. There are people also in our group that say, I don't trust any password manager because obviously a password manager is a very critical component. You really have to trust it. And for the single sign-on passwords, you could have the opinion that you never trust any software, yeah? I have a password manager. Yeah, that's again, it's a trade-off. And this decision is up to you. You have to make this decision, yeah, if you trust a password manager. So the benefits, it manages a large number of passwords. So if you have to remember all the passwords, then of course, it's very tempting to reuse the passwords because remembering a new password is somewhat pain yeah? and you want to reuse then the passwords. With a password manager, it doesn't matter. You just generate a new one. You don't even need to see it because the password manager knows it. Then it can help you to automatically generate long secure passwords for you and also to audit if your existing passwords are secure. And it prevents you to enter passwords all over again. Why is this important? There are, so input devices give a lot of attack surface. So you don't want to re-enter your password using, using a keyboard all over again, because when you enter the password, the, the string you enter goes through a lot of software layers. Yeah, 
and you probably want to prevent that, the password manager can just directly fill out the password or it can just copy it in the copy buffer, not letting your password traverse so many software layers or not you using an input device. Yeah, there were a lot of exploits with input devices. Again, you could argue who is interested in my stuff? Yeah, this is something for an, for an agent. I don't know, yeah, but that's how it is. Of course, the password manager, again, has a password. You need a password to the password manager, yeah? This one you has to have to remember. And, of course, this is a single point of failure. If this password is lost, that's really bad, yeah? But this is nothing we can do about that. Now, my options for password managers. There are built-in solutions. And, and, and again, we could probably discuss hours about that. Yeah, Some say, I only trust some big, big company yeah? because they have the, 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 the manpower and the knowledge to do that, like Google. I mean, Google, you can be critical about Google, but they do a lot for security. They care a lot about security. Of course, you could argue, well, all those US tech companies, they all have a backdoor. Yeah, we know that yeah, since Snowden and NSA. So it doesn't matter anyway. And of course, your passwords are stored in a cloud. You have then to trust, for example, Apple or Google or maybe Firefox. Yeah, That's your decision. Then there are commercial offerings. So, for example, we have people who have one password. They cost you something. So the usual business model is a monthly fee, like three euro, around three, three euros per month. So some say, if I pay something, I have more trust that this works and that this is safe. Yeah? Of course, the problem there is, as far as I know, apart from Bitwarden, it's not open source. So if you want to check the code, you can't. And finally, there are, of course, open source solutions. So there is KeePass. That's a very, yeah, very popular, portable, cross-platform um, option with a GUI. And then there are... I wrote pass and clone. So pass is a shell script, basically. This is popular among software developers who are Unix affine people. Um, it's based on GPT for encryption and uh, it, it, it can optionally use Git for synchronization. And now again, I can give you a recommendation because who do you trust? That's up to you. You have to know who do you trust. I can only tell you and I will tell you what I use but that was my decision, yeah? and you have to do your own decision. You even might, uh, and that's perfectly fine, decide, okay, for my single sign-on passwords, I don't trust anybody. So I remember my single sign-on passwords because those are not dozens. Yeah, Those are maybe three, four, five, maybe even less. And then for the not-so-important passwords, I use a password manager, but I don't really trust it. Yeah, You can do that. So what do I use? I use GoPass. So GoPass is a re-implementation of Pass in Golang. I, I wanted to use Pass, but I didn't work on OpenBSD yeah, because this shell st stuff is kind of not portable. And so I found GoPass and I'm really happy with it. Yeah, so GoPass is open source. You can really look at the code. I looked at the code. It's a readable code. It's, I think it's a clean implementation. It's completely based on GPT. So you don't enter a password to go pass. You have to enter the GPT um, um, password. So GPT is, is your interface. Yeah. So you also have to trust GPT, of course. It supports password sharing. So you could, for example, have a password store for your private password, one for your yeah, shopping passwords, and then maybe another one, which is shared within a team, like if you have an admin team or if you need to share passwords, you can do that. Um, the sharing, uh, the same as with pass, is done with Git, but it's built in. It's better integrated than with pass. It has a very clean and accessible command line interface. And in my opinion, a good and large active community. And it's really cross-platform. Cross so I like it. I'm happy with it. I use it on all my systems. So I use it on, on Apple Mac especially and on Linux and on OpenBSD, and it works very well. So if you search something, you might give it a try. One thing I have to say, if you are really not, yeah, if, if, if you 
if you're not a Unix person, uh, let's put it that way, then probably pass, go pass. It's not the right thing for you then it might be better if you if you need or if you want an open source solution better to look at key pass yeah, because that's more accessible yeah because this go pass thing and also pass you need to set up gpg you need to somewhat deal with git and if this is difficult for you then this is probably not a good solution for you so now let's start with secure shell i already said secure shell is the de facto standard in accessing hpc systems and um, now, this information on this slide is probably not really necessary to use Secure Shell, but I'm a history fan, and I think having some background knowledge doesn't hurt. So what is Secure Shell? It's a cryptographic network protocol. And on top of, of this network protocol, you can then implement services, and there are multiple services available. It was designed in 1995 by Tattoo Lönen, I find this remarkable because in the in the beginning of the 90s, you may you may know that Linus Torvald um, started uh, Linux, I think in 1991 or two or something about around that. So Finland was a yeah, well, did a lot of contributions at that time. Nowadays, Secure Shell is standardized by an Internet Engineering Task Force working group. Tatulonen founded a company, so there is also a company, SecureShell.com. But the most common implementation and probably the implementation most of you use is um, the Open Secure Shell project, and this is a part of the Open of OpenBSD. So I, th I think there are other implementations, but especially on Linux, this is probably the standard um, open source implementation. How does it work? So secure means, first of all, the user has to be authenticated to the system. So this, you have to tell the system that you are allowed to access the system. Then the other way around, of course, also you want to be sure that this is really the system you, you want to access, yeah? that nobody pretends to be that system. So the system has to be authenticated to the user. And of course, all transmitted data needs to be encrypted yeah? because as we know, internet in the beginning was not designed with security in mind. And so encryption is key because everything is kind of not secure inherently. The technology that is used is two types of encryptions, asymmetric encryption algorithm, so-called public key uh, encryption cryptography is used for authentication, authentication of the user to the system and also of the system to the user and the determination of a session key. And we will see in a moment what the session key is and how asymmetric encryption works is, you see on the right here in this illustration, we have Bob and we have Alice and you have a key pair. There is a public key and a private key. The public key you can give away and you give it to anybody you want to communicate with. The private key is really secure. You really have to keep this secure and safe. Nobody should ha should know the private key. Now, there are two things. You can encrypt stuff or you can sign stuff. Here, we only need to encrypt stuff. And it works the following. Bob can use the public key to encrypt something. And only Alice can decrypt it using her private key. And this is how it works. Yeah? So therefore, it's safe because only Alice who owns the corresponding private key to the public key can decrypt what Bob encrypted with her public key. The actual encryption of the data transfer, so the data channel, does not use this asymmetric encryption algorithm. This is only used for the authentication. This used a symmetric encryption. So this means both sides have the same key. And this key is negotiated for, for every session yeah? using uh, a session exchange key uh, algorithm we will see in a moment and using the session key. So let's see, we have a client on the left and we have the server. The client connects at this point, no encryption yet. Then the server sends its public key and then they negotiate and I go, don't go into details. Actually, I don't know this in detail myself. They negotiate and open a secure channel. What they 
um, uses, I, I think you can look it up on Wikipedia, it's called Hellman Diffie or something, key exchange algorithm. It's an algorithm which allows you, if you have such a asymmetric key pair, without ever explicitly exchanging it, generate a common shared key. Yeah, so, and this is what is done. So they use the public and private keys of each other and they get to our shared key, shared key without ever explicitly exchanging it. And then they use this shared key for the symmetric encryption of the data over the um, channel that's then active during the session. Next, um, the user is authenticated and this happens with this um, asymmetric public key algorithm. So as you see, when you generate a key, this key is only used for authentication. For the data transfer, another key is used that is uh, generated on a per session base. Okay. So now public key authentication. I, I go into this a bit, but give you a bit of a background. I think it's good. Of course, you can use it without understanding anything but I think it helps to understand what the basic concept is and what's going on now. Huh? So you can see the key, the private key as a password. Yeah? So it's a crypto cryptographic key pair is like a password. As I said, it's not used for encryption. Initially, this key public key authentication was intended for automation. So in the beginning, when they introduced that, it was really intended to be used without a passphrase to automate things over secure shell. Later on, they realized that a lot of people use this for, for user authentication. And I will come to why this, this makes sense. So first of all, with public key authentication, you have a kind of two-factor authentication. It's not completely independent, but you have to own something. This is the software token, the private key. And if the key is, is protected, is encrypted using a passphrase, you need the passphrase, so you have a knowledge factor. So you can see that this is a two-factor authentication. And with public key authentication, you can also implement a single sign-on solution. And there is a special pro uh, program with that, SecureShell Agent. This one remembers then, we, we, we come to this. Um, maybe I, I explain um, when explaining what's going on. So on the client side, you have the encrypted private key. And on the server side, you have the authorized public key. So you only can log in to the server if you set the server that this public key or that this key pair is authorized to log in. Then you decrypt the encrypted private key with the passphrase. So the passphrase is the key to decrypt it. Once you have the decrypted private key, then you can optionally store this decrypted key in memory using the secure shell agent. So the agent holds the decrypted key in memory. And when you have repeated access to a server, you go, you don't need to re-enter the passphrase over and over again. So, so you enter the passphrase one time and they can do all the work and all the authentication is done for you by the secure shell agent who holds the decrypted key in memory, which is a convenience feature yeah, at the end. So now, how does the authentication itself work? Once you have the decrypted private key, the server sends an encrypted challenge and it uses the public key to encrypt this challenge. As you may know, only the one who has the private key can decrypt it. So the client decrypts this challenge, which is some random data, and it then combines this challenge with the session ID. Then it creates a MD5 hash sum, a cryptographic hash sum, and sends this hash sum back to the server. Why is this so complicated? Julian probably can explain to you. That's the thing with security. For sure, there are a lot of reasons why they do it that way, but because this is so fragile from an outsider or someone who is not into this, for someone like that, it's difficult to understand why they do it like that. Yeah? So he sends the hash sum back to the server. Now the server, of course, has all the information also. He has the session ID, he has the challenge, 
And so he can also create this hash sum with the same algorithm. So he recreates the hash sum and compares it to the hash sum the client send it to send it to him. And this is the proof that this key, in fact, is allowed to access the server. So this is how it works. So there is something called agent forwarding because um, you might have run into this problem yourself. If you use a secure shell agent, this is only active on the host, on the, on the client you're on. So if you log onto another remote host, then the agent per default doesn't provide you any single sign on on this remote host. So if you, for example, from the remote host, log onto another host, then you have to re-enter the passphrase and the password or whatever is, is necessary to, to authenticate. And this is kind of inconvenient. And so um, quite early, they introduced another program, this secure shell agent. Uh, uh, no, sorry, not the secure shell agent. They introduced a feature called agent forwarding. And what agent forwarding does, it, it opens a channel and it forwards all authentication requests to the agent through this channel to the originating client. So if you need to authenticate, or for example, if you want to access a key, if you need a key, you can forward this and it's a socket through this channel. This is forwarded to the agent and then the agent sends the decrypted key also on remote hosts. The advantage is you do not need to deploy the private keys on the remote host, which is a good thing. Yeah? We will talk about that. It's really a critical point is you really want to keep your private keys safe. And of course, um, the less you distribute the private keys, the better. Yeah? And so you don't want to store your private keys anywhere else. And agent forwarding allows you to access or to hop or different systems without deploying your private key on a remote host. This is the user perspective. From the administrator's perspective, of course, things are different. Yeah. So authentication can be hijacked for an agent forwarding. There were a lot of exploits. You might have heard of the matrix. This is this chat client. They were hacked last year. And this was an exploit with related to agent forwarding. So, and also uh, everybody that can hijack this channel can then, yeah, authenticate something, yeah? So, and another thing is you forward this to a potentially untrusted remote environment. For the administrator, the user system is the untrusted remote environment. Of course, for the user, it's the other way around. Yeah? They are, well, the server is the untrusted environment. Mm -hmm. The general advice is, do not use agent forwarding. It's regarded to be unsafe. There are uh, a lot of exploits. And so just don't use it. There are better solutions nowadays to, to get the same benefit. Some commands and tips and tricks, probably all of you already know that. Um, recommended options for key generations. There are different types of keys. DSA, RSA, and others, I don't know the name, something with ED, something. When I did my PhD, everybody told me, you need to use DSA. That's the way to go. That's the modern thing. And it was kind of complicated. You needed to move your mouse to generate some randomness. And at some point, there were some issues. Um, you can read it in the internet. It's not clear if this is an, was an implementation issue or if DSA is really broken. Anyway. Uh, in open in open secure shell, DSA keys are limited to one kilobit, and one kilobit is regarded to be not long enough. So with today's compute power, you can you can crack this key. Nowadays, uh, and the keys get longer and longer because the compute power gets bigger and bigger. People recommend uh, that you use four kilobit key length. Yeah, and the default key nowadays is RSA especially because it's also the most portable one with different, probably older uh, secure shell implementations. So this is what we recommend at the moment. Use RSA as key type and use for kilobit. There is another option, dash A, I, I show you in the demo, which is uh, set to increase security. I don't really know what this option really does, but 
people say that it increases security and so yeah it's up to you if you want to use it but i think this command just using trsa for kilobit key length is fine if you use it without options the default key name is dot secure shell id rsa or you can of course also store it to an optional uh, out file if you have to generate multiple keys um, there is now a, a specialized command to copy the key to a remote server. It's called Secure Shell Copy ID, which is quite convenient yeah? because, um, yeah, uh, editing the authorized key, this is the file where you have to place then the public key to, to say that this key is uh, allowed to log in. Errors can uh, occur yeah? with, with editors. So this is a nice thing that we have a, a command for that. Um, there is a config file in your secure shell config directory. It's called config. And there you can specify per host settings. And this is quite convenient. I will show you and I will use it a lot. I think you should really use it. You can create aliases and um, have uh, host specific host specific settings uh, there in this config file. Finally, um, I told you that, uh, I didn't tell you, but I tell you now, you only want to use a secure shell agent in a for you trusted environment. And usually that's the client. That's your laptop. That's a single user system where only you have access. And in general, um, having running a, an agent on a remote multi-user system is probably not a good idea. Um, there are, again, solutions, yeah? If you want to use Secure Shell Agent on your client, there is a, a front end, it's called Keychain. It's perfectly fine to use directly Secure Shell Agent. The main benefit of using Keychain is that it gives you a persistent agent. So a an, an, an running agent across login sessions. So you can log, log in multiple times, log out, log in, and the agent is still there. Yeah? So this is quite convenient. You can have a look at it. Now uh, for the config file, um, the location is in your secure shell directory config, and it allows you to create shortcuts for hosts. You can also have global settings and you can uh, use wildcards there. Of course, the caveat is, caveat, uh, I don't know, settings are implicit. Uh, you use them the alias and um, you have to be aware that there are a lot of settings are there in the config file and you don't see it on the command line. Yeah, but I, I still think that the benefit is there. So I think it's a good idea to use it. And the configuration is in the main page, secure shell underscore config. Here's an example entry. Um, when you have a lengthy host name, for example, and probably also an RSE, your host name is different from your host name on your client computer. You just create an alias host RSE. You can specify other options like disabling the, the agent forwarding. Then you have the host name, the user. You could specify an optional um, public uh, um, um, key. And then later, when you enter the system or when you want to log in there, you just type secure shell RSE. And all this information is implicitly set. So this is really a convenient thing. So now some general hints, security hints for secure shell clients. First, and I, I mentioned this several times, the most important thing is the private key file. This is really critical. You want to keep the private key file secret. This is the most important thing. And secret means you want to keep it if you're really serious on an encrypted disk, on a single user system, on a desktop system, only you have access to. Yeah? Then um, the following files should be read only on, on the, on the um, server. So the authorized keys and on the client, maybe the known host file and the config file. Why? Well, you don't want to other people to, to add things there. I even think that Secure Shell doesn't work if uh, there are right, right um, rights on, on these files. Yeah? The, the problem with Secure Shell is if something goes wrong, it usually, for security reasons, silently fails. 
So if something goes wrong, it's usually quite difficult to debug it because it, it will not tell you what's going wrong. You will just silently fail. Then, already mentioned, use a 4 kilobit RSA key to protect the passphrase, or to protect the key by a passphrase, and use a strong passphrase, same rules as for passwords, so at least 15 characters long. If you use a password manager, I think that should be no problem. And now, the general recommendation, use a separate key for every client. So what you do is, for every client computer, you, you generate one default key, ID RSA, and then with this key, you access from this client all the system you want to, to get access to. Yeah? So you copy the public key and add it to the authorized keys on all target systems. The idea behind that is, well, if a account or a system is breached, then all keys are lost anyway, all private keys you have there. So one is just fine. Yeah? Adding more doesn't add security. Then you want to disable agent forwarding and elf uh, forwarding in the config file. And another thing, again, this is a convenience feature. I know that people and myself sometimes also do this, but it's, I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's a security issue. Do not leave open external logins in running Tmox or screen sessions. So Tmox screen are terminal multiplexers, so you can have multiple terminals or keep running. Detach, detach from them, log out, they are still there, and then log in again. And of course, someone who takes over your account and finds those sessions can attach to that and can use the logins. Yeah? So this is a potential issue. And you should, when you detach, you should log out of external logins. And of course, on the client installation, it's software. And even if they really try to keep this safe and secure, there are exploits. And so it's, as with every other security-related software, very critical to keep your software up to date. So really update frequently your secure shell client installation. If you have a, if you have a dis distribution, that should be done automatically. So consequences of those rules or those recommendations. I already said, private keys should be only placed on a single user system, best using encrypted task lists. And a multi-user terminal server like CSHPC, let's be true about that, is an untrusted host. And you don't want to store any private key on any important private key on an untrusted host. You don't want to run a secure shell agent on an untrusted host. And you never want to do agent forwarding to an untrusted host. And now the question is, how should I do my work then? Yeah? So if this is all not allowed, how should I do that? And we, we talk about that. So what's the use case? So the home directory, and this makes it even worse, is an NFS share. So this means if someone hacks one system, all systems are hacked because this guy can just add, create a new key, add this key himself to the authorized keys. And because this home is shared on all systems, he has access to all the systems. Yeah? So this is a bad thing, but as we know, there's probably not an easy solution because we need this convenience of a NFS home yeah? to, to do our work. So, I, and on the next slide, I will show you a solution that allows you to get on subsequent systems without using agent forwarding and without using an additional key pair. Sometimes you still need an additional key pair. You need to log in, for example, from CSHPC to another system inside the RCE network. If you need that, generate a separate key. A key pair you only use on the RCE system, only for internal logins, which you use nowhere else. So recommendation, again, use a separate key pair on every client. And if required, and you can do your work, it's possible. I, preparing in this talk, I changed my policy. I really now try uh, to get away without having a, a private key on the RSE home. It's possible. So if you need this, create a single key pair for internal use only. There are use cases, Git is an example, may, where you may want to access remote hosts from the RSE systems. Um, 
for Git, I would say HTTPS, I think works just fine. So there, I think uh, it's possible to use HTTPS. But for example, if you want to synchronize or copy stuff between HPC centers, there you might want to also use the single key pair. Uh, as I said, multiple keys, multiple private keys really don't make any sense because if someone hacked the account, he has all the private keys and it doesn't add security if you have multiple of them. Due to the security breach, um, this really steered up the HPC compute center community and you will see some panic things happening now. Yeah, So for sure, they will now introduce severe, very user-unfriendly security rules. And yeah, we will see. Yeah, uh, we, I, I don't tell you anything. I can tell you it's ugly. Yeah? And yeah, but we will see. I think it's understandable. I think they were shocked themselves that something like that is possible. And we will see what the future will bring. So now, this is a feature. This allows you to get on a subsequent host, on a on a on a client that is or on, on, a, on a host that's not visible externally. And the feature is called proxy jump. It was introduced with Open Secure Shell 7.3 and it allows you to access hosts behind the terminal server. In the secure shell jargon, they call this bastion host. Yeah? The connection is tunneled through the bastion host, but and this is uh, different from the agent forwarding. All the connections are done by the final target host. So, so uh, to the final target host are done by the initial client. Yeah. So, so the bastion host really only tunnels stuff, and this fact um, makes man-in-the-middle attacks impossible or a lot more difficult. So, it's a lot more difficult for people on the bastion host to hijack your tunnel to the final host, and that's at least they say that. I mean, again, it's software until the first exploit. Um, Secure Shell should give you a warning if someone attempts a man in the middle attack on such a proxy jump connection. So how does it work? Um, it's more, you can do this on the command line, but because it's a lot of options, it's, it's more convenient to do this in this config file. You set up um, the initial alias for the terminal server. So in our case, CSHPC, you need the host name and the forward agent and the user. I didn't have the identity file, identity file here because if I only have a single private key, then that's the default key and the default key is IDRSA. And so I need to explicitly specify it here. And then for every final target, I also create a, um, an alias. Here, I only need to specify the host name as seen on the on the bastion host and because on cshpc it's in the same subnet it's sufficient to just say host name emmy um yeah forget this uh, uh this is if you have separate keys but in our case uh, we use the same key um yeah you can remove that sorry and then you have the proxy jump command and you specify the bastion host so the terminal server to this proxy jump so proxy jump and then the alias to this terminal server and that's it. And now you can directly log in, for example, to Emmy from your client, yeah, through CSHPC in a transparent fashion. One thing, and I, I stumbled myself over this, all the keys you specify here, of course, have to be on the originating host, so on the initial client. Yeah? That's very important. So on the Bastion host, there is no key, yeah? no key needs to be on the bastion host. Everything is forwarded or tunneled directly to the initial client and you can chain those jumps. Yeah? So you can not only access one hop after CHHPC, but you could, for example, create a proxy jump to an internal host, yeah? like uh, a compute node. Yeah? This is not a convenient because you need to do it for every client, but it's possible. Yeah? So you can have multiple jumps using this technique. Another use case um, a lot of people need is automated file synchronization. And again, public key authentication was 
finally created for automated things, automating things over the secure shell. And a very common use case is to use rsync over secure shell passphrase less so that you can automate it by a cron job or whatever. And uh, there is a fairly safe way to do that with a passphrase less uh, key. The warning here, of course, the general recommendation is do not use passphrase less keys. And again, also internally in our group, there are discussions if this makes sense or if this is necessary, but this is the recommendation. But in this specific use case, and if you do it like described here, it is regarded to be fairly safe. I guess there are multiple solutions to this problem. I show you this solution because I used it myself. Yeah, you have to do. I guess there are other, other solutions. Yeah. So what you use is there is a dedicated script, rrsync. This is part of the standard rsync distribution. It's a Perl script. And what it does is it's designed to be run in a authorized keys context. So within the authorized keys on the target host, you can specify a command. And there, please, when you copy this, this mark, exclamation marks need to be the same as here. Otherwise, it will silently fail. Yeah, but you will see in the demo. Um, I will fix that in the final slides. And what it does is it puts you in a sandbox. First of all, it ensures that it's called in a secure shell context. It only works if called from authorized keys. And you can specify a path. That's the sandbox. And you can only access files with rsync that are within this subdirectory. So it's so you could see it like a change route for rsync. And of course, you can specify a lot more options to that. Yeah, like it is not allowed to be that this this is no login shell, no user RC, no no forwarding, no tunneling, and so on. Um, how to use it? Um, I will show you in the demo. It hopefully will work. Um, you set up an, a separate alias, again hostname CSHPC, and you create a passphrase less key for it. Specify it here. I call it ID RSA sync. And then uh, on the on the server, you add a key with preceding this line. Yeah, you don't need the options. What is important is the command. So command then RR sync, even with full path or uh, in, inside your path. So if it's in your path and then um, the path to your sandbox. I think on CSHPC, um, that depends on the distribution, how they package it. RR sync is usually not packaged uh, with the standard um, R sync package, but you can get it online. You can get it from Samba, uh, it's a Perl script. Yeah, just throw it somewhere in your path. Uh, path. I have it in in home local bin. Make it executable, and that's it. Yeah? On the client, then you call rsync e secure shell with this alias you specified in your config, and or with a with a directory. And remember, this directory is a subdirectory within the sandbox you specified on the server. Yeah. I hope in the demo I can show you. So now an outlook. So public key authentication is okay, but it's clear that to make it more secure, you have to increase the factors. And one thing a lot of people talk about nowadays are hardware tokens. Hardware tokens at another factor. You have to own it. It's a separate thing. And um, a hardware token could act as a subkey for, for example, a GPG key you then use for public key authentication, or it can also be used, not all of them, but some of them as a one-time password generator. Of course, server side, this has to be set up. And it looks like this could be an option to increase security. Of course, you have to buy the hardware token. It's, it's a price thing for a university. The question is, does anybody get this? Naive as I am, I would think, hey, people have their, their V card. That's also a hardware token. Why not use that? But I don't know. You need a reader then for that, yeah? And 
Other centers we know of um, also already sent pins to smartphones, uh, like you like it's standard in banking. In banking, it's it's accepted standard that you have a two factor and you get a pin or a token sent on your smartphone. Yeah. Also, Google has that, and Amazon, and a lot of other bigger tech companies. So those are the options, and um, yeah, we will see what happens in, in the in the near future. This incident, of course, will steer things up and things will change. So you, we will see some change. It's hard to say if in one year nobody talks about this anymore and everything is as before or if there is really a, a change. Yeah, I, I don't know. So now, now I have the demo and I, wait a moment, I have to... This is kind of a long talk, isn't it? They said you cannot talk longer than 20 minutes about Secure Shell. So you see, I can. Um, so what do we have here? I have a client server. Client is my laptop, it's a MacBook. And um, as you see, there is nothing there. No key, nothing. Huh? On the server, I'm on CHPC. And I also don't, don't have any private key there. We have enough time. It's already five. I hope you have enough time. So the first thing I want to do is I, I check to log in. I may, may, maybe you have done this before. Oh, wait a moment. Let's look at the config. I already entered the stuff in the config because that's a lot of typing. Do you see this window anyway? Can I have get some feedback? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you are still there. So I I created an alias for CSHPC. Well, this is convenient because here on my laptop I have another login, and also I don't want to remember this lengthy host name. And this is all we need to know for the moment. So if I try to to uh, log in using this alias, he he asks for my password. I don't enter it, but obviously there is no key set up, as you see, and. Some people would regard this to be a security problem that password-based access in general from everywhere is allowed. Huh? So I hope there are security measurements measures installed to make this safer, but it's in general, it's not very safe, yeah? but whatever. So the first thing I want to do is, and I do this um, just for, for showing you in this order, First, we want to create a passphrase less key, uh, key pair uh, in order to, to show you how this file sync can be set up. And so let's see. So this is the command. Secure shell key gen. Type RSA, I could omit that, that's the default. Length 4096, and I store it in a special file name because I don't want this to be my default key, yeah? because this is the passphrase last key, and I only want to use this for synchronization, automated synchronization. So let's do that. I don't enter a password, uh, a passphrase, so there we are. Here we have the key. So now what we do is we use this fancy, nice uh, copy ID command. So secure shell copy ID, dash I, he, he, he only copies the public key, so don't bother. And again, the alias. Let's look for a moment on the, on the, on the server side. I already have some private key, uh, public keys in there for my other clients. I don't have yet, obviously, otherwise I didn't need to enter my password from my from my laptop. Yeah? So there are just two keys. So now execute that. Oops. Ah, because I'm here. Let's enter this the full path. Okay, he asked me for my password. That's good news. So he added the key, that's it. I entered my password, he added the key to authorize keys. That's quite convenient. It's, it's more convenient 
to using STP to copy it and then to, to open an editor. So I think this is a fine thing. Actually, I didn't know this command before preparing this talk. Right? Let's look in authorized keys. And there we are. There is this key. Yeah. Now what we need to do, and let me, I, 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 I copy this because otherwise I make something wrong. I, 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 I guess. Um, now I prepend this key with the command as mentioned. Yeah? Let's go, oops, sorry. That's some bug in my key config. Oh my God, I hate it. Okay. So let's be very careful. Okay. So you prepend command, then double quotes, very important, the same double quotes. I, I, I correct the slides, sorry for it, but I, uh, the, the, the slides we put online, there it will be corrected. Then this RR sync. Again, you need to install this yourself. Install means get the Perl script from the Samba distribution, put it somewhere in your path. And then RR sync needs one argument, and this is the sandbox. Here, for the purpose of the demonstration, I, I choose temp. Yeah? So temp is, this, is the sandbox. And then I add some options to this, yeah, like no agent forwarding, no port forwarding, and so on. So that's fine. Hopefully that works. Let's save this thing. There we are. Then we go to temp. Oops. And there is some stuff there, but we will see. Now let's go back to the client. And now, uh, wait a moment. First, look again on the config. And in my config, I have this entry, rse-sync with CSHPC and with the identity file id sync So the special passphrase last key. First thing we want to try is, we want to just log into CHHPC just to see what happens. Now, now there is a key, before there was no key. Now we should try to use this key as passphrase less. So let's see what happens. He asked for the password. That's really bad, dude. Ah, sorry, I did the wrong thing. Of course, I need to specify RRC sync. So my, my fault. Okay. So he couldn't open a terminal. Um, and RR sync, the command that's executed, said not invoked via secure shell daemon. Yeah, so it doesn't work uh, in short. So if someone gets your key, he cannot log into the node. If this is really secure, I don't know, but this command prepending is regarded to be fairly safe. Yeah, safer than not using it. Yeah, let's put it that way. So now let's try to sync something. And I sync this. Important now, we expect this mini MD sync directory to be in the temp directory on the target. Yeah? Okay, and this works. Yeah? Without asking for a passphrase, fine. And here we are. Now we have here the MiniMD sync directory. So this was already a success. Go back here. So that, that's done. So the, ne the next thing we want to do is we want to create a passphrase protected key. Yeah. And I use the default options and I add this A100. You can read it yourself what this is about. Um, wait a moment. I do one more thing before. I don't remember the passphrase, right? I'm stupid. My brain is really bad in remembering stuff. And so I want to show you how to use GoPass. Um, the nice thing about GoPass is it has really a, quite a nice semi-interactive help on the command line. So you can call it, have all these uh, commands. And then, for example, for the generate command, that's the one we want to use. You can also enter help. Ah, oh, that, that was wrong. Wait a moment. Uh, okay. Sorry for that. Okay. F, I think help must be first and then generate. Help. That's better. Um, and there you then see the specific options for the generate command. 
And as you can see, there is even a XKCD option. So uh, GoPass can create a password that's made up of um, just words. You can even choose the language. Uh? It supports German and English. And you can also say, what's this, the, the separator? But anyway, I don't care. I just want to generate the password. Um, GoPass will not, now not ask me for a password because I already, um, it's also single sign on. I already entered the passphrase for my GPG key. So you have to do this once, similar to the secure shell agent. So I call this secure shell and then I call it Zaroman. That's the name of my laptop. So let's try that. The default password size, I can see it. Don't I can see it because of this big blue button, button thing. But it's 24 characters. Yeah? So that's the default length. I don't care because I don't need to remember it. And what GoPass then does is that takes some time. Good. Um, it copies it to the uh, clipboard for 45 seconds. Yeah? So we have to to now we have to, uh, oh my God, you know, when it needs to be quick, then it's not quick. So, and I, oh my God, that, that was not the right way to do it, right? Forget what I did. So I enter the passphrase from the copy buffer. And there we are. So now let's look in secure shell. And now we have two keys there. Our sync key, pathphrase less, we created initially. And then the, the, um, the default key, id underscore rsa. So now let's copy this key um, to here's HPC. Actually, how I do it is really not very, uh, not simple, yeah? but we can just edit because he uses, um, yeah, maybe I edit yeah, because sometimes he, he, he attempts to add several keys. I edit, uh, that's a safe side. You, you, you shouldn't need to, but I do it. And I hope, yeah, right, that should work. So now again, he asks for my password because here the default uh, will not use uh, the key and it also doesn't work. And there we are. Now he says he copied it. Let's check on the server. And as you can see, there is another key, yeah? different key. So he added now the password protected key. Let's try it. Oh my God, I need the passphrase because I don't have an agent running. Yeah. Okay, let's again. Uh, now we need to get the pass passphrase. And there is go, we just call it go pass dash C. And it will copy it again to the clipboard. So let's try again. Enter the passphrase. I mean, it's good. Now we know the, the key is really protected. And there we are. This worked. That's fine. Now, the next thing we want to try is this proxy jump. And I already entered the, the entry. So I need to access mostly three different systems within RRCE. That's any, the front end to the ME cluster, Maggie, the front end to the Maggie cluster, and test from the front end to the test cluster. And I added three entries for that, just the host name. Then, as I mentioned, as host name, you only need to add the host name as known on CSHPC, the user. And finally, the proxy jump and the alias of the bastion host, which is here our CH, CSHPC entry. And that should really work out of the box because we have a shared um, NFS home. And we already added, so we added uh, this key to authorized keys. And so also on any on Maggie, this is known. Huh? So we should now be able, and um, first of all, let's for safety reasons, because I don't have an agent running, um, copy the password, because of course I need to enter it multiple times, as you will see. Now let's try to get on any directly from my laptop, magically. First time. And another time now from getting from CHSPC to any. 
And there we are. Super. Yeah, that's actually it from my side.